This is our last day on Kant. Uh, we finally completed um, the transcendental analytic, uh, and we've seen uh, what the critique of pure reason was, uh, how the synthetic a priori propositions of math and science uh, were possible, uh, and why uh, it would be impossible to apply uh, the categories or the concepts of the understanding metaphysically uh, outside of experience. Uh, we prove that they're objectively valid within experience, uh, but uh, don't have any application outside of experience. So today, uh, we're talking about the transcendental dialectic. We finally got into this stage. We looked at a portion of that already when we looked at the paralogisms, um, which were ambiguities or mistakes in reasoning um, that come from trying to apply concepts outside of experience. Uh, today, we're looking at the antinomies, uh, which are contradictions in reason, again, that f uh, flow from uh, attempting to use concepts uh, outside of experience, attempting to do metaphysics in that prohibited sense. Uh, and today we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the other aspects of Kant's philosophy that use the faculty of reason uh, and that um, uh, attempt to talk about how we do contact the world outside of our experience. So remember, uh, the synthetic a priori propositions of math and science uh, were possible through the transcendental conditions of space and time and the categories, um, but that uh, the critique of pure reason was meant to show that metaphysics or the attempt to go beyond uh, experience were impossible, that there were no synthetic a priori propositions of metaphysics. Um, so uh, today we're going to look at um, the way in which certain metaphysical statements uh, are illegitimate because they attempt to go beyond experience. And we'll talk a little bit about how reason uh, in its ideas or ideals uh, does have a type of use. So remember, the uh, mathematics came from the transcendental conditions imposed by sensibility. Space imposed a grid uh, which was a necessary form of external sense, and it gave rise to the synthetic a priori propositions of geometry. Uh, whereas time was the form of our internal sense, and it gave rise uh, to the orderings that provide the synthetic a priori propositions of arithmetic. Um, the categories uh, we just proved uh, are the concepts of an object in general, the types of connections that are necessary for any type of synthetic unity of apperception or knowledge of self or knowledge of objects. Um, and we prove that they're objectively valid, so that means that the principles of science, the laws of science, which arise from the categories, will be true a priori for all experience. Um, but we also saw that they don't apply beyond experience, that the attempt to apply concepts uh, of the understanding beyond experience uh, are illegitimate uh, and that metaphysical propositions of that type don't exist. So the antinomies are an attempt by Kant um, to show how some of the traditional metaphysical topics uh, arose from these illegitimate uses of the concepts. Uh, and the transcendental dialectic um, shows how it was possible to prove both one side of a metaphysical controversy uh, and to prove the other side. You probably remember that dialectic involved um, a thesis and antithesis, uh, and then eventually uh, a synthesis. Uh, but Kant is more interested in showing the thesis and the antithesis, how you can prove both sides of a metaphysical debate, uh, and how contradictions uh, automatically arise when one tries to apply our concepts beyond the limits of experience. Uh, and we're going to see um, that the contradictions arise by using uh, the concepts uh, empirically on one hand and then transcendentally uh, on uh, the other hand. So there are four antinomies. We're going to talk most about the third and the fourth. Um, but the first uh, is uh, the antinomy of infinity, which said that the world is finite, uh, and you can also prove that the world is infinite. Um, there's a, a, a antinomy of composition that says 
Um, the world is made up of symbols of atoms that can't be broken up further. Uh, and then there's the antithesis, which you can also prove, as Leibniz held, that every uh, composite substance is uh, composed of other more simple uh, objects and that the world is continuous. So we're reading the third and the fourth antinomies, uh, the antinomy of freedom or causality. Um, you can prove that there is freedom in the world and you can prove that there can't be freedom in the world, that everything is determined. You can prove that God must exist, that there must be a necessary being as part of the world. Uh, and you can also prove that it's impossible for there to be a necessary being um, and that God doesn't exist. So these antinomies are contradictions um, that um, became part of the very structure of our concepts when they're attempted to uh, be applied beyond our experience. Uh, the idea of dialectic became much more important in the, in the philosophers that we talked about last time uh, who followed Kant. Uh, Hegel's entire philosophy was based upon the way in which uh, our concepts lead us intentionally outside of, our, uh, outside of themselves to their contradiction. Uh, whereas Kant thought that the dialectic just involved um, the illegitimate use of concepts beyond experience. Uh, and we're going to see um, that the antinomies involved is transcendental idealism and his empirical realism. Uh, transcendental idealism meant that the objects of experience are not real outside of our experience. Uh, whereas empirical realism meant that the objects in our experience are necessary and objective because they uh, are, are required by the transcendental conditions of space and time and the categories. Um, so we're going to see that when we look at the antinomies that the thesis uh, is always going to apply the concepts transcendentally in their illegitimate use outside of experience, whereas the antithesis is going to derive its conclusion by applying the concepts empirically in their legitimate use uh, from the categories. And we'll show how that works uh, in the third and the fourth antinomies. So the third antinomy uh, is about freedom. And we're reading the third and the fourth because they involve um, important concepts of freedom and God that became um, the basis of some of the other features of Kant's philosophy. Uh, remember, we're uh, just looking at Kant's critique of pure reason, uh, but Kant is equally famous and influential in his moral philosophy uh, and his philosophies of art and beauty uh, from the second and third critique. Um, so these third and fourth antinomies are particularly uh, important in relationship to those latter concerns of Kant's philosophy. So the thesis says um, that Causality in accordance with the laws of nature is not the only causality, uh, that there must be another causality, that of freedom. So the thesis says um, there is some type of freedom in the world, whereas the antithesis says there can be no freedom. The, the category of causality must apply to every possible experience. That's what we proved when we proved the objective validity of the categories. So uh, the arguments in the antinomy all take the same pattern, and they all follow the same pattern as the famous arguments of St. Thomas Aquinas uh, and Aristotle uh, about an unmoved mover or an uncaused cause, uh, tracing back a series of causes either to infinity uh, or saying that they must terminate. So in this case, the proof for the thesis says um, that if there were no freedom in the world, then every state would have to come from a previous one. Um, and if every one uh, state came from another one, there wouldn't be an absolute beginning. Um, and because nothing can happen without a sufficient cause, um, it can't go on forever, and there must be a first cause. There must be some type of freedom in the world. This is applying that concept uh, transcendentally, outside of experience, um, and imagining that we can take that principle of causality and apply it even outside of our experience to things in themselves. Whereas the antithesis uh, applies the concept of causality only empirically uh, and says that if there were freedom in the world then you'd have to have this first event, uh, this spontaneous act of will, uh, 
And if that were true, then there'd be no connection between that first event, that spontaneous act of will, and the events that followed or preceded it. But we know that that's impossible because all experiences have to be in accordance with the category of causality. Um, therefore, there can't be any freedom in the world, and every event must follow from every other uh, according to causality. So uh, Kant thinks that um, this is what happens when you attempt to apply concepts outside of experience. You land yourself in these types of contradictions. Uh, and this particular antinomy gave uh, rise to Kant's famous double point of view or dual point of view theory of freedom. So uh, phenomenally, all of our events and thoughts are determined. Every thought follows from a previous thought. Every choice follows from the previous um, uh, experiences and choices that we've made. Yet noumenally, as our transcendental ego, the um, unity of apperception, the spontaneity of our synthesis, um, that we can apprehend only transcendentally or intentionally, as we saw in the last two classes, um, that uh, selfhood, that spontaneity is free. So we can be both free and determined. Uh, we're free uh, noumenally, that uh, self that we can only know as a transcendental requirement and only feel intentionally. Uh, yet uh, every single one of our events is still in accordance with science. So the noumenal freedom of our self is not at all in contradiction with the fact that according to science all events are determined by physical law. Um, this became a very, very influential point of view in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer um, wrote a series of works called Will and Representation, thinking that the fundamental reality of the world was will uh, and that physical law were merely representations of that will. Uh, and that had influences uh, on uh, English literature. Uh, and the, uh, the Russian author Tolstoy uh, was influenced by Kant and Schopenhauer. His great work War and Peace is all about this dual point of view. Uh, on the one hand, the war sections uh, of the, the novel represent uh, events and the great campaign of 1812 where Napoleon invaded Russia uh, as all following deterministically from causes uh, and the people involved with them as being trapped up um, in events that uh, are somehow beyond their control. Yet at the same time, there are the peace sections of the uh, novel that talk about love affairs and choices and, and uh, the search of various different characters for the meaning of their existence. Um, and from their point of view, they're free. Uh, from the inside, their lives are free uh, in their choices and spontaneity. Uh, yet from the outside, uh, when we look at them as experiences of phenomena in the world, uh, they must be determined by physical law. So this dual point of view theory, that we could be both free and determined, um, is, uh, was a new type of view of freedom that became very influential. Um, so uh, it's the only um, theory within modern philosophy that talked about a type of freedom um, that was radically free in that sense. Our noumenal freedom uh, isn't determined by physical law, um, whereas even uh, philosophers like Spinoza and Locke uh, and Hume uh, had all thought that we're free but we're still determined by physical law because uh, our freedom was just being self-cause. Uh, but Kant thinks that our noumenal freedom is a freedom in a much more radical sense despite the fact um, that all of our mental events and all of our experiences and things we see in the world are determined in accordance with law. Uh, and in the second critique um, the critique of practical reason, in which he deals with morality, uh, and the summary of that in the groundwork uh, towards the uh, foundation of metaphysics for the metaphysics of morals, um, Kant um, considers freedom as a requirement of moral theory and establishes a type of noumenal freedom uh, as a postulate of practical reason, as something you have to take for granted uh, in order to believe in morality. The fourth antinomy um, deals with God, and uh, just as we've seen before, when you would try to do metaphysics, you can prove either side of this proposition. On the one hand, the thesis says 
that there belongs to the world uh, an absolutely necessary being, God. Whereas the antithesis says it's impossible for a necessary being to exist in the world or outside of it as its cause. Uh, and the proofs for each of those uh, work uh, almost exactly the same way. Um, the sensible world contains a series of changes, uh, and every change requires a, a, a cause or a condition, without it which it would not be possible. Um, and every condition presupposes a complete series of conditions, um, which can't go back to eternity, so there must be some first cause or some absolutely necessary cause. Um, so a necessary cause is um, um, proven as part of or as the cause of the world because this series of causes can't go back forever. Uh, here, in the thesis, again, uh, the concept of causality is applied transcendentally outside of experience. But in the antithesis, um, we apply causality empirically. Um, and since uh, assuming a necessary cause would mean that there would be an uncaused event of uh, this act uh, uh, in which God created the universe, or God. Um, and since it's impossible, since the category is objectively valid, to have uh, an uncaused necessary event, that um, it couldn't exist as an experience, uh, whether it was um, the first event in the series that was caused by God, uh, or um, some first spontaneous event within experience, it doesn't matter. There would be um, some uh, uncaused event that came from a necessary being, uh, and therefore uh, it would violate the category of causality and couldn't exist as an experience. So according to that argument, when we apply causality uh, empirically, uh, we see that there can be no necessary being outside of the world as its cause. So uh, later, in the, according to the second critique, uh, Kant will prove God and immortality as postulates of practical reason. Again, requirements uh, of morality. If there were no God and if there were no immortality of the soul, um, then real justice and real morality would be impossible. Um, so the, the, the idea of God, or a necessary being as the source and structure of the world, uh, is taken by Kant not to be uh, a concept that we can prove as existing in this world, uh, but as an idea, uh, or sometimes he used the term ideal, uh, because uh, they don't function within experience to create objects the way that concepts do. Um, they function as an ideal to regulate our behavior. Uh, and this became a very influential concept of God as well. So um, some Unitarian churches, uh, for example, um, don't believe that God exists as an object in the universe, but, but believe that God exists as an ideal um, towards which uh, human action ought to aspire. Um, Kant believed that there actually was a God, uh, but he thought that we couldn't perceive it within experience, and the belief in God as a, a postulate of practical reason um, didn't contradict um, the fact that within experience um, there could be no uncaused actions. So um, Kant introduced um, the, uh, another way in which our concepts could function as ideas or ideals um, that went beyond experience. In those cases, they couldn't give us truths. Um, they couldn't allow us to perceive objects in experience. Um, that's what concepts do. Um, in that case, they serve merely as ideals. So in the third and the fourth antinomies, we get Kant preparing the way for um, a different view of how we can uh, talk about and theorize uh, 
uh, about objects beyond our experience. So despite the fact that there can be no metaphysics, we have no synthetic a priori propositions about freedom or God, and we saw how the attempt to do so leads to contradictions when we attempt to apply our concepts transcendentally. Um, Kant is um, already, we've seen, uh, him rejecting the mind's eye model of perception. Um, our experiences, our phenomena, are in our senses, uh, and we perceive them uh, as constructed by the understanding. Uh, but we saw um, that uh, transcendentally, uh, through transcendental consciousness, we have a type of sense of the existence of objects outside of us, and we have a type of sense of the spontaneity uh, of the ego, the transcendental ego, or the noumenal self inside of us. Um, so Kant didn't think that we were a closed closet, um, uh, merely uh, a mind trapped within itself, not able to perceive anything outside of itself. We did have these other modes of consciousness, this transcendental consciousness of ourself um, and of the necessity of objects outside of us. Um, so Kant, in um, the latter parts of the Critique of Pure Reason, said that two things fill him with uh, admiration and awe. Uh, the starry heavens above and the moral law within. So he thought we have this other type of consciousness, not determinate consciousness of phenomena in accordance with science, not metaphysical knowledge, um, but uh, a type of feeling or intuition or a different type of sensory access, of non-sensory access to the world. Uh, when we feel our conscience prompting us, we're feeling our noumenal freedom and we're feeling God uh, through the workings or urgings of our conscious, consciousness or conscience. Uh, our moral conscience. Uh, and we f when we experience beauty in nature, uh, we're getting the sense of a purposiveness without a purpose uh, or um, of set of values in the natural world that doesn't come from our experience and isn't imposed uh, by our concepts. Um, so Kant's, um, uh, the latter parts of Kant's philosophy um, became the source for uh, a different tradition uh, in uh, culture called Romanticism. Um, Kant's the last modern philosopher in terms of what we talked about in the Critique of Pure Reason, but the fact that he believed that there were these other sources of, of uh, relationship to the world, that we weren't uh, locked closets or islands of subjectivity, that we were rooms with a view, uh, made him one of the, the founders of philosophical Romanticism as well. Um, so besides sensibility and imagination and understanding, which we've been talking about, uh, there's also the faculty of reason. Um, it can't do metaphysics. Attempts to do metaphysics leads it to dilemmas or antinomies. Um, but it's capable of reflecting upon itself and, and thinking about these uh, transcendental sources of apprehension of the world that come through um, the urgings of conscience and our experiences of beauty. So in the, uh, his last two critiques, the Critique of Practical Reason and the Critique of Judgment, um, he talked about the way in which the beauty of nature uh, and our experience uh, of our conscience um, widens our understanding of the world. So Romanticism was that movement in art and music and literature um, with figures like Beethoven uh, and Caspar David Friedrich, the German artist, uh, and Wordsworth and Coleridge in England, and Goethe and Schiller uh, in Germany, uh, which uh, talked about the way in which feelings and emotions could affect uh, a transformation in your experience. Uh, after Kant, people are going to think that those um, concepts of the understanding are like uh, mind-forged manacles, William Blake would say, um, that they were types of brainwashing that we should attempt to break free of, um, to find a more true uh, and immediate interaction with the natural world. Um, so whereas Kant would have disliked all of these romantic themes because he thought that um, our categories uh, and the transcendental conditions of space and time imposed upon us an ordered objective reality, uh, which we, we could escape through from um, the moral law within and the starry heavens above, um, later thinkers would think that um, maybe the categories are not necessary, 
Um, maybe they're just the imposition of culturally imposed structures on us. Um, and uh, <coughs> the Romantics would advocate um, passive experience of nature that acted as a moral guide by sensing or feeling the purposes implicit in nature. Uh, and they would emphasize uh, reacting against convention, um, even suffering passion or violent emotions or even dark uh, themes such as death or violence um, to break us free uh, of the brainwashing um, that our concepts imposed upon us by culture have provided uh, and which allow us to um, perceive the world in these other ways. Um, so they emphasize the sublime in nature, uh, which are things in nature like the clouds and the mountains uh, or the icebergs um, that go beyond human sensibility, that break open our transcendental conditions and force us to have this other type of transcendental consciousness uh, of uh, a world outside of our experience. That's the, uh, the source of our experiences of God, of beauty, uh, and of morality. Um, so again, um, whereas Kant in the Antinomies uh, is telling us about the dangers of taking our concepts beyond experience, he is also going to introduce this other type of transcendental consciousness of things outside of us. Uh, and where he, as he would limit it to the starry heavens above and the moral law within, uh, later philosophers would suggest that it's this other type of consciousness that's most important, uh, and that the scientific and rational consciousness um, that Kant advocated in the critique of pure reason uh, is actually dangerous in some ways. Um, so again, Kant, the last Enlightenment philosopher um, uh, and the first post-Enlightenment philosopher, the last modern philosopher uh, and the first post-modern philosopher.